So yes, James is a rationalist and a skeptic. Um, he's studied a Bachelor of Science degree at uh, the University of Melbourne right now. So he's focusing on maths, physics, and computing. He has aspirations of entering the field of computational neuroscience, of which he spoke on at Future Day, and we have a video of that. It's quite a quite a good talk, actually. Um, and is yeah, so which applies to computational and mathematical techniques in an attempt to unravel the mystery of the human brain. And he's currently the president of the the University of Melbourne Secular Society. So put your hands together for James Fodor. Thank you very much. Thanks, Adam. Uh, so today in my presentation, I'm going to be talking about uh, what, I've, what I've titled the, the shaky foundations of science, or uh, an overview of the big issues in uh, the philosophy of science. So some of this stuff will uh, overlap a little bit with um, the, the first speaker today, because uh, I cover a couple of the same issues, although I go into a bit more detail and have a slightly different, uh, slightly different emphasis. So the, uh, the, the basic message that I want to convey today is that science is quite a lot more complicated than perhaps a lot of people think, or even a lot of scientists think. So some of the questions that I'm going to be uh, sort of addressing is uh, how well grounded is science uh, philosophically or epistemologically? Epistemology just means the, uh, sorry, my walking, is that better? Um, epistemology just refers to the um, study of knowledge, so what we can know. So the question that I'm going to addressing, be addressing here would be how well grounded is uh, the scientific statements? How sort of confident can we be about them? And then sort of how does that differ between fields? Um, what does philosophy have to say about the methods and practice of science? Um, so there are some scientists, at least. I think people like um, Lawrence Krauss have made statements to the effect that philosophy is just pretty much useless to scientists, or uh, it has nothing to say, it's sort of irrelevant. Um, I'm going to be sort of critiquing that idea because I think it, it does have relevant things to say. Um, yeah, and why should we care about philosophy of science? Okay, so an overview of what I'm going to be talking about. Um, First of all, I'd just say that this is hardly a comprehensive list of sort of some of the big problems in philosophy of science. These are just some of the things that I've picked out as I think are important. Um, what I'm going to be starting with is talking about what a view I call naive falsificationism. Uh, this is a sort of a, I think, a simplistic model of the scientific method or the process of science that I think a lot of people have in their heads, um, and arguably even a lot of scientists. Um, that's, so that's point one here. And then the subsequent points, essentially I'm going to be looking at different problems or issues that uh, philosophers talk about in philosophy of science. Uh, which I think uh, cast doubt uh, in various ways on, on this naive falsificationist model. So I'm going to be talking uh, in order about the problem of induction, the theory relatedness of observation, the problem of underdetermination of, of theory by observation, um, different models of uh, scientific explanation, so what, what it means to explain something scientifically, and uh, finally the topic of scientific realism. And, uh, and then I'll offer some conclusions. So that's the, that's the broad outline of what I'm going to be discussing. So first of all, let's... Um, Let's look at what I call naive falsificationism. Now, oh, j just another point. Um, to, to give you a sort of a, an introduction to some of the key thinkers here, I've put up um, some names and pictures of, uh, throughout the slideshow of some of them, uh, the key philosophers of science. And sometimes where I've decided to stick them is slightly arbitrary because they often do work across multiple areas, but they're just sort of there to uh, uh, give you some names to look up if you're interested. Um, Karl Popper is often associated with this, this idea that I call naive falsificationism, although that's a little bit unfair because his views were quite a bit more sophisticated and nuanced than what I'm presenting here, but uh, certainly um, he is commonly associated with this idea. So what am I talking about when I say naive falsificationism? Um, well, I'm, the way I'm defining it is as a sort of a simplistic uh, notion of what the scientific method is that still, I think, generally taught in schools. I know I learned something like this when I was in high school. Um, and I think a lot of scientists, or at least people interested in science, have a sort of a, an implicit notion of this as what the scientific method is. Um, and I'm not, even say, I'm not even going to say that this is exactly wrong, more that it's just far too simplistic and that if we really want to understand science, we, we need to move beyond this uh, model. But, but what, what is this naive falsificationist model that I keep talking about? Well, it hinges on this uh, idea of falsifiability, which Karl Popper, again, um, sort of famously popularised. Falsifiability is the notion that it's possible to prove something wrong by some conceivable evidence or argument. Popper said that beliefs that are unfalsifiable are not scientific. So an example of something that's not falsifiable is this uh, little passage that I pulled off the uh, astrology website. Um, so this was my, so, so I'm a Capricorn is my star sign, I think, and this was my yearly um, astronomical whatever they call it exactly, prediction or something. So uh, this is a year in which your true self may be rediscovered. With Jupiter in the opposing house of relationships, uh, 
partnerships and marriage, you will find new ways to balance the need for independence and self-discovery with the need of others. This will be your biggest challenge uh, by far. So it's not at all clear what this is even saying, uh, let alone how we could possibly go about proving this wrong. Uh, what does it mean to say that Jupiter is in the house of opposing relationships and partnerships? I have no idea. How could we find out if that's true or false? Um, this is a year in which our true self may be rediscovered. So maybe it will be, but maybe it won't be. So if it happens or it doesn't happen, there's no way to find out if that statement was true. So, you know, this is sort of an, an obvious example of something that's unfalsifiable. It's a, it's a you know, pretty obvious, uh, I think, astrology as, as being a classical example of unfalsifiable. But this is the basic idea. Falsifi falsifiability refers to the ability of something to be proved wrong. Now, this... Hmm. Uh, unfortunately, this doesn't come up quite as well as I'd hoped, um, but I'll, I'll walk you through it. This is what I'm uh, going to call the naive falsification as model of the scientific method. So essentially, it runs like this, and you might have heard something like this before. You start off by asking some sort of question about the world, um, and then you do some thinking about the question and try and figure out ways of answering it, or maybe look at what other people have said, and then you form a hypothesis. So by hypothesis, what I mean is just an idea or a, a statement about what might be the case. Like, I think here, here's a possible answer to, to my question. So you formulate a hypothesis, and then you go and test the hypothesis. So you conduct an experiment or, or um, obtain observations of some, of some kind, um, and then you look at the observations or the experiment, and you see, is my hypothesis correct or not? Uh, as Popper would say, you attempt to falsify your hypothesis. You attempt to find evidence that your hypothesis is wrong. Um, if you can falsify your hypothesis, the hypothesis is proven to be false, um, well, then your hypothesis is wrong and you have to construct a new one. You, you go and find a new hypothesis. If, on the other hand, the hypothesis is true, well, then you go and publish a paper or something like that. Um, and you've discovered new knowledge. S slightly parenthetically, um, Popper didn't like to say that a hypothesis was ever proven true. What he said is that it survived the attempt at falsification. So the idea is you come up with a hypothesis, you try and falsify it, and you fail. So you, you couldn't prove it wrong. Then you try another way of falsifying it and you fail again. And if, if repeatedly the, the hypothesis survives attempts at falsification, then Popper would say something like it becomes a theory or it becomes accepted or something like that. But anyway, that's not terribly essential to, to this main point, point here. The main point that I want to get, a, to get across with this uh, model of the scientific method is that you, ha you have a question, you form a hypothesis, you do an experiment uh, to test that hypothesis, and the experiment determines whether the hypothesis is true or, or false, and you reject or uh, accept the hypothesis on the basis of your experiment. And that's essentially what science does. And then you just sort of repeat this process over and over through for different questions. So that is what I'm calling the naive falsificationist model of science. Um, sort of this linear, simplistic model of, of science about hypotheses, testing them against observations. So what I want to do with the rest of this talk is sort of critique this. Uh, how accurate is this? How much does it capture of what science does? How uh, clearly does this replicate the actual what's done in science? And, and how well does it illustrate how scientific knowledge actually works? So the first... Uh, problem that I want to bring up is the problem of induction. This is um, very commonly associated with David Hume, although many, many people have talked about it as well. So before we talk about the problem of induction, obviously we need to know what induction is. Now, many of you may have heard of induction, but I'll just quickly go over it just uh, so everyone's on the same page. Induction is a method of inference. That means it's a way of finding out if things are true, basically. Um, but it's a fallible method of inference, which means that you, you don't come up with uh, cert you don't arrive at your conclusions with certainty when you use induction. So this is distinct from deduction, which is like what we do in logic and mathematics. You start with your axioms and you use rules of inference, and you come to certain conclusions that, that if you've you know, done correctly, can't possibly be wrong. But in induction, it's completely different. Uh, induction is a process where even when we arrive at our conclusion, even if we've done it properly, we still could be wrong. So that's what it means by fallible. There's sort of different ways of describing exactly what induction is. Um, there's sort of two versions that I put up here, sort of simplistic enumerative induction, which goes something like this. So all swans that I've seen are white, so therefore all swans are white. All swans everywhere are white, because everyone I've seen in the past is white. Um, that would, it's, it's a generalization based on a, a finite set of observations, because we can never observe all swans or all of anything. Uh, we can only observe, ever observe a limited number. Induction is the process of saying, well, a bunch of them have been this way, so all of them must be this way. A slightly more sophisticated version of induction is like a probabilistic version in which it would say, well, most swans that we've seen so far are white, so therefore if I see another swan, it's probably going to be white. Um, not that all swans are necessarily white, but there's, you know, the difference between those is not hugely important for my purposes. Um, so induction is a method of inference which is used 
almost universally in the sciences. We make specific observations about um, you know, the, the interaction of particular chemicals in a particular experiment or the behavior of particular organisms in a particular environment or um, collect statistical data in a particular experiment. And we generalize, we make a general statement about what happens outside those experimental or observational situations. So that's a, a process of induction. We, we also talk about a sort of universal laws or laws of nature. And again, that, that's an inductive process where we start talking about that because we can never observe all of nature or like all of time. So the question, uh, so, so that's what induction is and its role in science. The problem of induction is asking the question, how can we justify the use of induction? How can we justify inductive inferences? Now, the first thing to understand is that induct induction doesn't follow deductively. The fact that I've seen a bunch of white swans, it doesn't follow deductively, like by logic, that the next one must be white or is even probably going to be white. Um, so we can't, we can't justify induction deductively. Um, Perhaps we could use an argument like, well, it worked well in the past. So we've used induction for hundreds of years and it's pretty much always worked pretty well. So we should use it again. So it probably works. Um, that seems like a fairly compelling argument to a lot of people. I mean, and in a sense, it is a pretty compelling argument. The trouble is it's question begging. That is, if you've, been, if you've noticed, it's using induction to prove or demonstrate that induction is valid. It's saying that while we look at the way we use induction in the past, and therefore we infer by induction that induction works. It's a circular argument because it presupposes what it's attempting to conclude. So that doesn't seem to really work. So the question is, how can we justify induction non-circularly? That's, that's, that's the problem of induction that David Hume raised um, and that philosophers have been debating ever since. There's also some other related questions, like, for example, how can we tell the difference between good and bad induction? Uh, here's an interesting inductive argument that you might consider. So whenever someone dies, it's never me. Therefore, I probably won't die. Now clearly that's a ridiculous argument. The conclusion is obviously false. But can, compare it to this other argument. Every day the sun has risen from the east, therefore it will rise from the east tomorrow. I could also say every day someone has died and that's never been me, therefore I'm not going to die tomorrow. And I could always use that argument every day. So these arguments seem almost identical, but yet one is clearly right and one is clearly rubbish. So how can we actually tell the difference? You might, you know, there's, there's various answers one could potentially give, but if you think about it, it starts to become a little bit less clear as to how we could resolve this. Um, so there have been a lot of responses to Hume and about the problem of induction, and I can, I certainly won't go through all of them, and I, I'll just sort of briefly address these here. Popper said, as I have mentioned before, that we should re just reject induction, just throw it out. Theories are not supported by evidence, but they just survive attempts at falsification. But it was, Popper was always a little bit unclear as to exactly how we should talk about theories that have repeatedly survived falsification. Do we say they're true? Do we say that they, what do we say about them exactly? It's, so most philosophers don't find that particularly compelling. Um, there have been various other responses, which I'll just go through quickly. Some people have said, well, induction is just a necessary truth. There's nothing to say about it. It just must be, must be true. Um, Others say, well, they adopt sort of a pragmatic approach. Well, we don't know if induction will work or we can't sort of justify it, but if anything's going to work, it's got to be induction, so we'll just sort of use it anyway. Um, and there's other views that sort of take a linguistic approach, which say, well, when we talk about good reasoning or uh, valid reasoning, the notion of induction is sort of built into those very ideas, so it doesn't sort of make sense to ask um, why is induction valid, because it's built into the notion of what it means to say that, that reasoning is valid. Um, but anyway, that, that, uh, that problem certainly hasn't been resolved and there's a lot of dispute about that. So that's the problem of induction. How can we justify the use of inductive inference, which is used pretty much universally in science? The next problem that I want to address is uh, called the theory latedness of observation or the theory dependence of observation, which was touched on briefly in the, the first talk today. Um, so Thomas Kuhn, he, um, he wrote a book called the, uh, the Structure of Scientific Revolutions, I think it was called. He popularized the notion of scientific paradigms. He also did some work on the, the theory, uh, theory lateness of observation, which is why I've got him here. Okay, so uh, why am I discussing this? So naive falsificationism, if you remember that diagram of uh, the scientific method that I put up at the start, naive falsificationism says that we test theory, or we te I should say we test hypotheses, uh, by making empirical observations and then seeing whether the hypothesis is falsified or not. But this seems to presuppose that we are able to make observations or collect data without uh, appealing to the framework of some particular theory or some particular um, prior knowledge that we have. But this doesn't seem to be quite right, and I'll give, a, I'll give, some examples, uh, give some examples shortly. It seems that we can only, at least in most cases, maybe all cases, we can only make observations within the framework of some particular theory or some particular uh, view of how things work. But if we can only make observations, if we can only actually collect data within the framework of some particular theory, then how can we 
falsify a theory or test a theory in some sort of absolute sense. It seems we can only say, well, within the framework of how I collected the data this way, I, I falsify or don't falsify the hypothesis, but maybe if I use a different framework to look at the data, then I, I would come to a different conclusion. Now, that might all seem rather abstract, but let me give some uh, sort of practical examples of this. So here I've just put a mishmash of what I think are some examples of data or observations in some of the different sciences. So here we have this an X-ray crystallography image. This is um, a micrograph of a cell, an electron micrograph. This is a waveform of someone speaking. This is just some generic uh, statistical data. These are um, uh, particle tracks in a bubble chamber that's used in particle physics. Some um, functional MRI images, and oh, this is a, a, spectro, um, a spectroscopy image from um, using chemistry. So. What is the point of all this stuff that I put here? The point is that, so, so obviously I've taken these out of context. You don't know what was being tested. I mean, I don't even know what's being tested for a lot of things or what they were looking for. But even if I told you, well, here's uh, what the context was here and here's the hypothesis that was being tested. And then I ask you, does this data, look, here's the data, it's right there. Does it support the hypothesis or refute the hypothesis? Does this data support the hypothesis or refute the hypothesis about the structure of some particular chemical molecule? Does this data support the hypothesis or refute the hypothesis about some particular mental activity? Does this data support the hypothesis or refute the hypothesis of the existence of some particular particle or uh, something else in physics? It's really not at all clear. You have to use a lot of inference to, uh, to work that out. So, for example, this image here, which some people might have seen before, this image was uh, basically uh, behind the discovery of the double helical structure of DNA. So, this tells us that DNA has a double helix structure. Now. I don't know about you, but that's not at all obvious to me from looking at that. How do you get double helix out of that? Well, the answer is you use a lot of complicated algorithms through your optics. You need to make a lot of assumptions, or at least um, have prior knowledge about how light interacts with, with, um, with, with crystalline molecules and how that uh, varies between the structure of different types of substances and all sorts of things you have to use to go from that to double helix structure of DNA. Even with uh, things like statistical data, that's another great example. So how can I tell if that mush of numbers what does that tell me about anything? I need to uh, test some, hy some hypothesis, and I need to do that by making assumptions about relationships between variables, which variables to include, which variables not to include, uh, how, what type of statistical distribution to use for my errors, and all sorts of different things. I have to have some structure that I put onto the data in order to say anything about it. The numbers by themselves don't really tell me anything. Um, even, even in things like biology, um, when you're looking at micrographs or other things like that, I don't know if anyone's done a dissection, but I did some of those um, when I was doing a biology course earlier in the year. And you know, you, you cut open an animal, and it, it's just a mush of organs and uh, tissue, and it's really hard to tell what is what. You have to look very carefully and compare it to this nice sketch that you've got uh, about where everything should be, and compare that to the mush of reality. And very much, uh, what you observe is very much shaped by what you're expecting to see. Oh, where can I observe the spleen? Where's the stomach and these other things here? And that's even more the case with you know, micrographs and other things like that, where we're looking at just all of this ridiculous complexity in the cell. We have to have a lot of prior knowledge about what we're looking for and what should be there and what shouldn't be there. So the basic point I want to make is that I think, maybe not in literally every field of science, but at least an awful lot, uh, we have to have a lot of prior knowledge and uh, bring a lot of uh, theories to bear when we're interpreting uh, pretty much any type of evidence. And so there isn't this clear notion of, well, we just observe things and therefore we test hypotheses. What we actually do is the data that we observe, the, the way we look at things and interpret them, and even the very questions that we ask and the very types of data that we collect, is dependent upon our theories and uh, other hypotheses that we believe. And so there's, a, there's no clear separation between hypotheses on the one hand, or sort of theory, and evidence and observations on the other hand. They're, they're, inextricably mixed together in a very complicated way. Um, and I think this is, in part, what, uh, what, what Kuhn was getting at when he sort of talked about paradigm shift in science, because there's not this clear way you can just test hypotheses in isolation one from the other. Um, they're all sort of comp mixed together in a complicated way. Anyway, hopefully that was relatively clear. Um, I'll now move on from uh, theory dependence to talk about uh, the third problem, which is underdetermination. This is uh, particularly associated with Pierre Duhem. So what is underdetermination? This is a little bit similar to uh, theory dependence, but it's also a little bit different. So underdetermination, or specifically it's underdetermination of theory by observation, is the idea that the available evidence, so the observations we've made or the experiments we've done, is always consistent with a very large number of possible theories or hypotheses that, that explains that data. So the question is how do we choose among them? There's so many possibilities, how do we pick which one, which theory or which hypothesis we believe?
It's, um, as I said, it's related to theory-latedness of observation, but they sort of look at it in slightly different ways. Theory-latedness focuses on the fact that we can't collect observations independently of our underlying theories. Uh, underdetermination says, given the observations that we have, how can we make a theory out of it? And the answer is, it's actually hard, because you can make all sorts of different theories out of the same observations. Now, there's slightly different versions of underdetermination. Um, confirmational holism and contrastive underdetermination. And those sound like horrible mouthfuls, so let me try and... Um, let me try and break that down a little bit. So confirmation holism. In science, when we conduct an experiment to test a hypothesis, and so we make a prediction, let's suppose our prediction is fail, it fails, it's falsified, we, we got it wrong. Question is, what do we do? Clearly we have to reject something, clearly we got something wrong, we had a false belief somewhere, but what do we reject exactly? Because there isn't just one belief that we had that led to that experiment or that allowed us to interpret the results of that experiment. There's a whole web of beliefs that, that structure out the way we interpret things. So which of these beliefs do we reject? Or do we reject all of them? Or, or what, what do we do exactly? So to give two examples um, about how this worked historically to illustrate the point, um, in the early 19th century, it was discovered that Newton's uh, theory of the, uh, about where the orbit of Uranus should be was uh, was not correct. It didn't accurately predict the orbit of, of Uranus. So, what did, what, so scientists had a choice. Do they reject Newtonian mechanics, or do they posit that another planet must have existed beyond Uranus, uh, called Neptune? Um, and they went with the latter option. They said, well, we don't want to reject Newton because he's been wildly successful. And so instead, we're just going to say that there must be this other planet out there. So you'll notice that, according to the naive falsificationist notion of science, uh, this observation that the orbit of Uranus was, uh, was wrong should have falsified Newtonian mechanics and we should have thrown out Newtonian mechanics. But of course scientists didn't do that because Newtonian mechanics had been wildly successful. Instead, they uh, changed one of their other beliefs and that other belief was, well, uh, that there weren't any other planets uh, sort of screwing up the calculations. So they, they changed that belief and said, well, there must be this other planet out there which we can't observe. And sure enough, later on this other planet, Neptune, was observed and that was, um, and that approach of, of positing a new planet instead of rejecting Newton was sort of, sort of verified. So, this happened again in the sort of late 19th century. It was found that the orbit of Mercury was a bit off. It, wasn't, it also wasn't where Newton uh, had, uh, where Newtonian physics predicted that it would be. So, uh, perhaps learning from the case of, of Uranus, scientists said, well, we know what to do here. There must be another planet inside the orbit of Mercury, even closer to the Sun, which they called Vulcan. But in this case, it turned out that they were wrong. It was Newton. It was Newtonian mechanics that was wrong in this case, and, and this, um, this evidence um, about the quirks in the orbit of Mercury was one of the predictions that was um, satisfactorily explained by the general theory of relativity. Um, so the point is, in the one case, scientists said, no, keep Newton, uh, posit a new planet, and they were right. In the other case, they did the same thing, and they were wrong. So this hopefully illustrates the, the kind of point I'm trying to make about when, when, something, uh, when we have a false belief or make an incorrect prediction, which, which um, beliefs about reality or about our scientific models do we reject or how do we modify them? There's no clear right answer about that. The same approach can work in one case and not in the other case. So how do we know what to do? Quine, uh, who's another famous philosopher of science, said that, uh, about this that the unit of empirical significance is the whole of science. What he means by that is you can't test one hypothesis in isolation of everything else, like holding everything else to be true, just test this one particular belief. In fact, you can't even, according to Quine, test little units of, uh, little groups of beliefs. What you're doing is you're testing all of science against reality. And when we make a wrong prediction, all we know is that something in all of science is wrong. I mean, which we sort of knew anyway. So the question is, how do we decide what that thing in all of science is that's wrong? Now, obviously, you know, you, you could over-exaggerate that and say, well, we can't do anything in science and just throw up our hands and say that knowledge is possible. Um, Quine wasn't saying that, and I'm not saying that. The point, though, is that it's clearly, clearly there's a lot more going on here than the, na the naive falsificationist model would have us think. So that, so that was, um, sorry, that was confirmational holism. That's the notion that when we, uh, when we find out that one of our beliefs is wrong, what do we reject? And it seems that uh, our beliefs are sort of bound up into a whole that's uh, hard to, to pry apart. Uh, the other version of underdetermination is called contrastive underdetermination. And this is basically picking between different theories that explain the same set of data. The notion here is empirical equivalence. That is, the two theories predict the same things, the, the same uh, empirical observations, but they um, posit different mechanisms or they have different explanations for these, um, for these observations. So which of them do we pick when they're empirically equivalent? Sort of by definition, if theories are empirically equivalent, you can't uh, test to see which one of them is different. At least at the moment we can't test. Maybe later we'll be able to figure out a way, but um, at the moment we can't. So, so how do we pick between them? Uh, 
to, to give a, an imperfect example, I've just got a few um, illustrations here. So all of these three uh, scatter plots have uh, data points in the same place. You can imagine we're just measuring something and plot the, plotting them on a graph. The question is, what sort of curve should we fit through these points that, that sort of explains the relationship between, um, between these variables on the x and y axes? Um, you'll notice that this curve here, I'm not sure what color that is appearing on the, this projector, uh, this one, not the, not the red one, um, is different in all three of the instances. Here it sort of fits them fairly well. This is a simpler curve, uh, but doesn't fit quite as well. This is a much more complicated curve, but that sort of goes through more of the points. So which of these curves do we pick? I mean, this one's more accurate, um, but this one's simpler. So how do you sort of adjudicate that when you've got accuracy versus simplicity? This is actually not quite a perfect example because these, these models are not, in, uh, are not empirically equivalent because, you see, they don't predict the same things this one would predict that all of the points would lie along this uh, nice parabola here, whereas this one predicts that they sort of go all over the place. So that's not a perfect example, but maybe it illustrates the point about you know how do you fit models to, to data and how do you weigh up, um, how do you weigh up um, simplicity of your model versus accuracy. Here's another example which you've probably seen before, and this is an example of empirical equivalence. So the question is, is this a duck or is this a rabbit? Can everyone see the duck and the rabbit? So this is the ears. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Just, just turn your head might be easier. Anyway, the point is, it seems that saying that this is a rabbit and saying that this is a duck um, are equally good explanations of our observation here. They, they equally well explain what we see and, and uh, the different um, patterns in the image. Um, and they're empirically equivalent. There's absolutely no difference between them because you're looking at exactly the same image. Um, this is often used as an example sort of an optical illusion, but I think we can sort of illustrate um, the idea of the empirical equivalence of theories using that sort of example. So hopefully those examples illustrate at least a little bit the, the point I'm trying to get at here. Um, and there are philosophers like Stanford uh, who will say that um, typically in the history of science, even if we have one theory that looks really good, later on it will turn out that we discover that there are better theories that explain the available evidence, just that we haven't, we haven't thought of them at the time. So this is called the problem of unconceived alternatives. When there are better theories, we just haven't thought of them yet. But we will think of them at some point. So maybe you'd use um, r relativity, a general relativity compared to Newtonian physics. Newtonian physics was really awesome, but it turned out that there was an even better alternative that people hadn't thought of at, at the time, namely um, general relativity. So even if it looks like the theories we have are, are pretty good uh, at the time, it might turn out, and indeed, according to Stanford, we should think that it probably will turn out this way, because it has so many times in the past, um, that there are even better theories that we just haven't thought of yet or at least as good theories that are empirically equivalent. And then, again, how do you determine the difference between um, empirically equivalent theories? So that's the problem of underdetermination, the theory of observation. Now moving on to the, the, the fourth problem that I want to talk about today, which is the, the issue of scientific explanation. So Carl Hempel talked a lot about this. Um, the, the, the question here is, what does it mean to explain things in science? So a major goal of science is to provide explanations for things. Pretty much everyone agrees with this. Uh, to construct explanations of things that we observe in the natural world or uh, to, to understand things better. But what does it mean to be a good explanation? What makes something a good explanation? How can we tell the difference between a good and a bad explanation in science? Do, ex do explanations have to make predictions? What about historical sciences that only deal with uh, sort of a fixed body of evidence and we can't really find out anything new? The example I like to give in this is, uh, although some people might say this is in science, but if you're an archaeologist and you've dug up every possible um, artifact from the, the, the site that you're interested in, or the, the collection of sites, um, you're not going to find any new artifacts because you've, you've uncovered them all. Does that mean we can't theorize or make theories about the people who lived here because there's no possibility for prediction? Um, it doesn't seem so. It seems we can still theorize about it. So saying that explanations have to make predictions seems to, to rule out a lot of things, or, or maybe psychology, where we can't make specific predictions about much of anything, but it still seems we have at least some knowledge about how humans behave. Um, something I mentioned before, how can we judge the simplicity of an explanation or a theory? Generally, people want to say that simpler explanations are better, but how do you cash out this notion of simplicity? What does it mean to be, to be simpler? Uh, simpler certainly doesn't mean easy to understand, because quantum mechanics is really hard to understand, but it's also generally considered to be very simple in some, uh, in some sense uh, as well. Compared to, all the hypothesis, compared to all the observations that it explains. And as also I noted before, how do you weigh up competing virtues of an explanation? So you might have an explanation that has wide scope, that is it covers lots of different things, um, but maybe it's pretty complicated. So is that a good explanation? Or maybe you have a simple explanation, but it only covers one very specific thing, so it has narrow scope. So how do you weigh up those different virtues of an explanation? There's, again, no real clear way of doing that. 
Now, one very influential uh, notion in the, um, in the philosophy of science, which I'm pretty sure Hempel came up with this, is called the deductive nominological model. Again, a little bit of a mouthful. Um, don't worry too much about the name. This is just an approach to explaining how science explains things. Um, oh, just a um, slight bracket back to something we talked about before. Remember, this, is, this discussion is uh, occurring in the context of the naive falsificationist model that I talked about at the start. So the naive falsificationist model didn't really say anything about explanation or about theories. It just sort of said we conduct, construct a hypothesis that explains uh, the, that answers the question that we had. But, I mean, it didn't say anything about how that happens. The point I'm trying to make with, with this section here is that it's actually really hard to say what we're doing when we construct an explanation. Um, and, and there are a lot of complexities here. So that, that's how this fits into the naive falsificationist thing that I talked about earlier. So coming back to uh, deductive nominological model, this is one attempt at constructing a, 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 well, an explanation of explanations, an explanation of what it is when we construct an explanation. So what does the, the DN model say? It basically says that a phenomenon is scientifically explained when we can logically derive that phenomenon, so using logic or mathematics, we can derive it from some laws of nature that we've hypothesized or that we know about. So to give an example, because that's, that's pretty abstract. So if I begin with the position of Mars, oh, sorry, I want to explain the position of Mars in its orbit about the sun at some particular point in, in time in the future. So that's my observation, or it's a prediction, but um, same thing in this, in this context, that I want to explain. I begin with Newton's laws, so these are generic laws of nature, uh, Newton's laws of, of motion, and also some specific facts about the, the, the mass of Mars and of the Sun and other planets and things like that. And then using those, uh, those specific facts and also Newton's laws, I can derive, log by logical reasoning, the future position of Mars. According to the DN model, that, is a, that constitutes an explanation of the position of Mars. Why was Mars at this position? Well, it's because of these laws of, of, of nature and I can derive the, uh, the position. Therefore, I provided an explanation for why Mars will be in this position at some particular point in time. Hopefully that's somewhat clear. Um, it's a fairly abstract concept, but um, there are some pretty obvious problems, like what is meant by a law of nature. I mean, this might work for physics, but how does it work for, say, biology? But um, that's, what, that's what the special sciences is, by the way. I sort of love this way that in philosophy of science, the term special sciences is used to refer to every single science except for physics. <laughs> um, a lot of the philosophy of science is pretty physics-centric, um, but anyway. Yeah, physics or chemistry, but if you're a real purist, it's probably just physics. Anyway, um, but there are some obvious counterexamples, I think, to this DN model um, of, of explanation. So, so according to the DN model, if I want to say that, if I want to say, well, why is, so I've got a, 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 um, a flagpole, let's say, and I want to say, why is the shadow this length, two meters or however the shadow, how long it is? Why is it that length? Well, according to the DN model, I could say, uh, I know I have some general laws of nature about optics and the sun's rays and how they interact, and I also know the height of the pole. So putting those together, I can derive from those laws of nature and some specific facts, I can derive that the length of the shadow must be this long. And it turns out that it is actually that long, therefore I provided an explanation for the length of the shadow. So that's all good. The DN model uh, works. But does it? Because actually, you can flip it around. According to the DN model, this is also a perfectly good explanation. I can say, why does the pole have this particular height? I can say, well, I know about the laws of optics and the, the way that um, the sun's rays uh, shine and cast shadows. And I also know that the sun is at this particular angle with respect to the pole. And I, I know the length of the shadow. Therefore, I can, because I know the length of the shadow and, how, um, and, and the laws of nature about the sun and, and light, I can derive that the length of the, the height of the pole must be you know, this certain height. And I go and measure the pole and, hey, it's exactly what I expected it to be. The, the trouble here is, is, I mean, the maths all works out, but the trouble is we're saying that we can explain why the pole is that high because its shadow is this long. But that seems completely backwards. That's not an explanation. You say that the shadow is this long because the pole is this high, not the other way around. But the DN model has no way of saying which of those is a good explanation. Um, so that's an obvious, an obvious counterexample. Another counterexample is, is this one here, which I kind of like. Um, so according to, again, according to the DN model, this is a perfectly good explanation for why John Jones, some male, failed to get pregnant. Why did he fail to get pregnant? Well, he failed to get pregnant because he has been taking birth control pills regularly, and all males who, who take birth control pills uh, regularly fail to get pregnant. That's our sort of law of nature, um, a general observation. So according to the DN model, this is a perfectly valid explanation for why he failed to get pregnant. 
Of course, this is rubbish because we know that there's extra information. Obviously, males don't get pregnant. That's why he failed to get pregnant, because he's a male. It's got nothing to do with whether he was taking birth control pills. But the DN model fails to have any way of incorporating that uh, sort of extraneous information. Um, there's irrelevant information in here which looks like it might be relevant according to the DN model, but it isn't relevant. So uh, those are just some sort of simple counterexamples that have been presented in the literature to, um, to cast some doubt on whether this is really a good explanation of what we're doing when we construct explanations. So, uh, recognising those failures, philosophers have tried to put forward a whole bunch of other explanations about about explanation. Um, I won't go into too much detail about these because it gets pretty technical. Uh, the statistical relevance model basically says that an explanation is just an assembly of statistically relevant properties. Um, so, yeah, I probably won't try and explain that too much more because it gets a bit mathsy, but um, that does avoid the, the, the John Jones problem, but it has its other issues. Causal me mechanical model uh, talks a lot about specific causal processes and, and chains of interactions between phenomena. And that gets pretty metaphysical, and so there's various other problems with that. Unificationist account um, says that scientific explanations are like logical structures which allow us to derive descriptions of lots of phenomena from as few initial facts as possible. You want to try and restrict your initial facts as much as possible to explain as many phenomena as possible, and that's what a good explanation is. Um, you know, don't worry if those don't make too much sense because, again, they're very technical and there's lots of issues and pretty much all of them have their problems. Um, if you look at, I think the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy was mentioned um, earlier and there's some really good articles about that here. You'll see what I mean when this stuff gets really technical if you have a look at that article. Um, so the basic point, I think, to take from that is that scientific explanation is really hard. It's really hard to say what we're actually doing when we construct an explanation or how to tell whether one explanation is good compared to another. That's not to say that we can't actually explain anything again. Um, it's just to say that we, we uh, ought to be a bit more cautious. And certainly, I think the uh, naive falsifications model really fails in, in uh, allowing us to understand what we're doing when we explain a phenomenon. OK, so that was, um, that was um, number five. So final uh, issue or problem that I want to discuss is that of scientific realism. So Quine talked quite a bit about this. This was mentioned, uh, again, uh, in an earlier presentation today. So scientific realism addresses the question of what does science actually say about, quote unquote, the real world? Are scientific explanations true about some objective reality or are they merely like useful descriptions or approximations or something like that? Um, there's different ways that this is understood. Um, in particular, uh, scientific realism is interested in this question of theoretical entities. So a theoretical entity, again, uh, there are different definitions of what this is exactly, but the usual idea is it's something that we can't, it's something that science talks about, but we can't observe directly. So a tree would not be a theoretical entity because you can just see a tree, um, but an electron would be a theoretical entity because you can't directly observe an electron. You, you can infer their existence or their presence by the way they interact with other, other particles um, and, and so on. So the bubble chamber that I put up earlier is a way you can detect particles, but that's not a direct observation, that's a sort of an indirect inference. Uh, photons, another example. In biology, we have these as well. So genes and species are often given as examples of theoretical entities because you never observe a species. It's sort of an, an, an abstract concept that you talk about. Um, and it's hard to define exactly what a species is, it turns out. Um, so, so that's the basic idea of theoretical entities. It's these constructs talked about by science but not directly observed. The question is, do they exist or not? Now, you might think it odd that philosophers debate about whether electrons exist because scientists just talk about them all the time. The issue is not whether electrons are like imaginary or something like that. The issue is just whether when we talk about electrons, are we talking about something that really exists in some objective sense, um, in some ontological reality, or are we just talking about some sort of uh, construction, some way of viewing the world which is really useful, but we shouldn't sort of in interpret it as being literally true. Um, and these two positions are called realism and anti-realism. So realists say, yes, electrons are real, they actually exist. Anti-realists say, eh, I don't know if you can know that. They might say they don't exist, or they might just say we can't know whether they exist. Um, now, a lot of philosophers, are, well, from my sort of experience, a lot of scientists, sorry, uh, don't really care very much about scientific realism. They just sort of take a naive realist attitude and say, well, of course electrons exist, why are you bothering me with this stupid question? Um, but I think that this is actually an important question, in part because it relates to what we can actually do with science and what we can infer from it, particularly if people want to start addressing questions of, of philosophy or of religion or of other things like that. You often actually want to know whether these things talked about by science really exist or whether they're just sort of our constructions or uh, ways of looking at things which are useful. Um, but anyway, so I think it's a relevant question. What are some arguments that people have raised on either side? There are 
books written about all of these types of arguments, so certainly I don't have time to go through uh, in detail, but just a few of the things that people have said. So the, the main argument I think used for scientific realism is called the, the success argument, or it's also called the no miracles argument. Um, the basic idea is that science has been so successful in providing explanations or making successful predictions and developing technologies and all that sort of thing, um, how can you possibly explain this, how can you make sense of this success of science unless its theories actually refer to real things? So uh, this is called the no miracles argument because according to its proponents, if scientific realism is not true, if electrons aren't real, then the success of science becomes a miracle, it becomes inexplicable. And um, that's considered to be an undesirable outcome, therefore we must accept that scientific entities, are, that theoretical entities are actually real. Another argument used for realism is the idea of corroboration. So uh, the basic idea here is that the same entities can often be predicted by multiple different methods in science. So, the idea might be that we can detect electrons through lots of different types of uh, experiments uh, in physics and they sort of fit into a lot of different models and so it would seem implausible that that would be the case unless again we were actually referring to the same ultimate objective reality when we're doing these experiments. What do scientific anti-realists say? Well they say a lot of different things. Uh, one of the arguments they use is, is pessimistic induction. Uh, this idea is that history shows that most theories or many theories in science turn out to be false even if they're really useful and successful. Uh, Newtonian physics is the example I always like to give. Um, Newtonian physics is, was ridiculously useful, it's still ridiculously useful, but in some sort of ultimate sense it's, it's wrong, or it's, it's, uh, it's certainly not completely true at, at least. Um, so the idea is if we can have lots of true theories without them successful, oh, sorry, lots of useful and successful theories, uh, that, but nonetheless uh, not strictly referring to actual entities that exist in reality, then maybe we should be pessimistic or we should be uh, reticent to say that the entities that our current theories refer to actually exist. So that's the pessimistic induction argument. Um, there's also a sort of an instrumentalist position, um, which essentially, it's sort of just adopting a sceptical attitude about this sort of philosophical, philosophical talk. It says, that, well, it isn't really meaningful or valid, it doesn't really make any sense to talk about uh, unobservable, so things that we can't observe directly. So according to at least some instrumentalists, they would say, well, physicists should, stri strictly speaking, should just talk about the um, things that they can observe directly, like the tracks in the bubble chamber or whatever else, or their mathematical constructions. Um, when they talk about electrons, they're sort of doing so metaphorically. They're sort of talking about these, these constructions that, they, um, that explain phenomena that are helpful to them, but they're not, they, they, we can't make literal uh, claims about these things that we can't observe directly. Um, yeah, there's sort of a, a lot of complicated philosophy that gets bound up in exactly the difference between the observable and the unobservable world, but uh, we, we won't get into that here. To, tr to try and illustrate this uh, a little bit more concretely, um, I don't know how well you can see this. So, so this top image here is just comparing Newton's idea of space with Einstein's idea of space. So Newton thought of space and time as being, uh, as being fixed and as being absolute, and space as sort of being flat, extending out in three dimensions, um, essentially to infinity. Um, and that's the sort of cosmos that he, the, the, uh, the ontological reality, so the, the real nature of how things really were that, that he based his theories on. As we know now, of course, that's all wrong. So space, is, uh, space and time are sort of conjoined in a very direct way. So we think of four-dimensional space-time. We also know that space and time are relative to the observer. So uh, events that are, occur at the same time to one observer don't occur at the same time to another observer. It depends on your velocity. Um, there are different frames of reference. No one frame of reference is privileged over others. Um, space and time also bend, resulting in lots of interesting observations. So this is a very, very different notion of space-time than, than Newton had. Um, nonetheless, Newton's theories were still were very successful and still are very successful. So it, it, this would be potentially an example of pessimistic induction, where we see, well, d despite how successful these were, they didn't really refer to anything that, that really existed. Or at least, they certainly got a lot of things wrong about the real nature of space and time, at the very least. Uh, the other example I have at the bottom here is, is the notion of atoms. Uh, so this, this diagram is probably the one that's easier to see. Um, so since the 19th century, uh, physicists and chemists have been talking about atoms and uh, I think at some point in the 19th century it generally became well accepted that atoms actually existed. Of course, the ancient Greeks originally posited, um, Democritus, or Democritus I think originally came up with the idea of atoms. But um, the word atom, which I realize isn't not actually written here, the word atom literally means indivisible. And that was the original idea of what an atom was. It was just sort of a, a single unit that was indivisible. It was the smallest possible uh, unit of, of uh, matter that you could have. But then, as scientists learn more about uh, atoms, they realize, well, that they probably have internal structure to them. This is Thomson's model. Uh, they're sort of um, 
concentrations, I think, of positive charge he had uh, in, in his atom. And then Rutherford sort of uh, expanded on that when he posited the existence of the nucleus, so the really heavy bit in the middle. And then Bohr expanded on that when he had the idea, well, electrons actually orbit in particular orbits about the nucleus. And then we have finally the quantum mechanical model, which replaces the idea of these discrete orbits with probability clouds of electrons existing in various configurations about the, the nucleus at the center. Now, the point there is that this conception of an atom looks almost nothing whatever like this conception of the atom. They're just completely different ideas. This one is indivisible. This is completely divisible because there's all sorts of different parts to it and, and the probability clouds and all sorts of weird things that you never even thought of. So if we want to say that 19th century scientists had discovered something real about reality, they really observed real uh, atoms and they really existed, at the very least we have to say that they had a lot of very wrong beliefs about what the atoms were like because they were nothing like and we now think that they are. Um, and you could extend that maybe. Well, is this what atoms are really like or, or are there some other elements of it to it that we haven't decided? Uh, that we haven't discovered yet. Um, or is, is this notion of probability clouds really just sort of, is that really what atoms are like or is that just our way of talking about it? Um, and then you get into a lot of hairy issues there about philosophy of quantum mechanics and other things like that, which we, we didn't get into here. Uh, just, uh, those were just sort of to illustrate the, the basic ideas um, of, the, um, of scientific realism and different ways of understanding uh, what science is saying. So, uh, to sum up and make a few conclusions, um, science is messy um, and we need to be careful in making claims about science or its findings. There's no sort of, I think we should, we should give up these simplistic uh, models of the scientific method like naive falsificationism that I presented or, or similar views. Um, and I think that philosophy is useful for helping us to understand what we're doing in science and what science can do and what it, what it can't do or where it's, uh, where it's complicated or confusing. And um, I think it also helps us to sort of determine good science from bad science or at least to, to make some... Uh, reasoned judgment about it. I think to be, to be informed, uh, rational, uh, careful consumers of scientific knowledge, we, we ought to be informed about these type of debates in philosophy of science. So as an example of the type of science that we want to avoid, I'm not sure if you can read this, uh, unfortunately I think we do see this sort of thing in science, well, too often, I won't say how often, but more often than it should, uh, that science consists of the following steps. You collect a lot of data, you look for correlations and make some nice graphs, and then you publish a paper. Now, this might look like science, but I, I don't think it really is science. And in part because I think that when you're doing that, you're ignoring these issues of, well, what does it mean to explain something? Finding a bunch of correlations is not an explanation, at least I would say that it isn't. Um, what type of, how are you making these observations and how are you distinguishing that from the sort of theory uh, that's underpinning the, uh, that's underpinning your observation? So that's the issue of theory, um, the, the theory dependence of observation. Um, and what claims are you making about the findings and data that you've observed? So that might be the realism, anti-realism uh, issue there. So uh, just, this is just an example of how you might apply these sort of issues of philosophy of science to uh, what I might call bad um, applications of, of science. Uh, another example here, which I think this is, oh, PhD comics. I don't know if anyone knows that site. Uh, very strongly recommend it. Um, so the, the real, the, sorry, the, um, the the scientific method that we think we follow is something like this. You observe natural phenomena, formulate a hypothesis, test the hypothesis, modify it if necessary, and then eventually you, you have an established theory which is based on repeated validation of your experimental results. Um, that's basically a version of naive falsificationism. Now, according to this comic, how does it actually work? Well, you, you make up a theory based on what the funding agency manager wants to be true. You design an experiment that uh, will prove, no, that's not right, will show, uh, no, that's not really right, suggest that the theory is true. Uh, then you modify the theory to fit the data, publish a paper renaming the theory to a hypothesis to make it sound like what you've done is scientific, and then you defend the theory despite all evidence to the contrary. <laughs> now, I think this is obviously a bit too pessimistic, but we can see this in science, I think, sometimes. Um, and I think an understanding of the issues in the philosophy of science can help us identify when this sort of thing is happening and maybe make reasoned and, and uh, careful critiques about exactly what, what's gone wrong here. So that's uh, essentially the conclusion of my presentation. I'll just make some uh, same shameless self-promotion at, at the very end here. So I have a, a blog and a, pod, a science podcast. Uh, if anyone's interested in checking those out, uh, the blo my blog is called The Godless Theist, where I talk about issues of philosophy and epistemology and a bunch of other things. And in my science podcast, I just talk about findings in science and chemistry and physics and biology and stuff like that. Uh, so if you're interested, uh, that's called The Science of Everything podcast. Um, Anyway, uh, that's all I have to say, so thank you everyone for listening. Do we have some time for questions? Yeah. Uh, if you, yeah, please move. A lot of questions, so much as comment. I don't think that this case in the uh, thing is, is truly more than maybe 60%. <laughs> oh, that's all right then. <laughs>
Yeah. yeah. Depends who you ask. <laughs> that, that, that's a whole big issue in, in philosophy. Yeah, um, that, you mentioned a couple of times like, that the tree was, um, yeah, yeah. was basically real and not a great entity because we can see it. So then you say, oh, well, I can't see it, it becomes a great entity. At what point do you have a distinction between a directable, directable entity and not? Yeah, and this, this is one thing that's discussed. Like, I mean, in some sense, I don't directly observe the tree. What I have are perceptions <laughs> that I interpret as a tree. The real tree, if it exists, is sort of exists somewhere out there, and that's you can get into all sorts of knots about this. Oh, yeah, so a lot of philosophers would argue that. Uh, nonetheless, I guess the basic point is it does seem there is some difference between when we talk about electrons and trees, that there's maybe some difference there, and that's the kind of basic idea that I think we're trying to get at out of a theoretical entity. But maybe. I, I'm, not, I'm not taking a strong position on that. I'm just trying to give you a, a, give a sense of what the issues are. Yeah. Um, so. Can I just follow up? Yeah, sure. Um, one of the ways that people do make a distinction is, is it measurable? So a tree, photographic, is measuring in all sorts of things. Electrons, you can't directly measure. And trash, you can measure yeah, charges, uh, but you can't measure them. Right. So that, that's one distinction that people do a lot of use. That, that's a tough question. We're not going to resolve it here. But <laughs> <laughs> yep. So at the very beginning, I said that I don't want to come across as saying that naive falsificationism is, in some absolute sense, wrong. Um, what I'm trying to say is that I think that it's, it's a sort of a very first, first order approximation, rough outline of how science works. Now, for some purposes, uh, it may be perfectly adequate. And I think it's perfectly reasonable to ask, well, is this falsifiable? I'm not saying that that's an an unrealistic or an unuseful criteria, or what, what evidence supports this. Um, so I'm not saying that we should just forget about naive falsification and throw it out as total rubbish. I'm saying that it has its uses, but we shouldn't think that that exhausts uh, what science does, or that that's a sufficient uh, account of science. I think my, my point was, if you just have a naive falsification, view, I think you miss out on a lot of these complexities and are unable to make proper sense of what science does and its limitations and other things like that. So I'm not saying that it's wrong, get rid of it. I'm saying yeah, it's... Um, it's partly helpful, but if we want to be sort of more sophisticated in, in our understanding of science, I think we should consider some of these other issues as well. Yes? Jason, thanks. Really enjoyed your talk. Um, sorry, it's the half name. Jason, sorry. That's right. Um, the, the uh, who was it that said uh, extraordinary claims? Sagan said that, I think, yeah. Sagan, quite extraordinary evidence. Yeah. So, you know, I thought it was a really interesting problem. What levels of evidence are uh, uh, justifiable in support of the claims? And what would you like to talk about So how much evidence do we need in order to justify a particular type of claim? Well, uh, to me, the, the, the significance of the claim in respect to you know, the, the existing body of knowledge actually uh, has an impact on the, um, the level of evidence that you need yeah. to support. Yeah, so that, that's... This idea of the uh, adequacy of evidence or how much evidence you need to justify a particular level of confidence is a really big issue in when we're talking about the uh, models of scientific explanation. So this statistical relevance model um, has uh, probably a fair bit to say about that. So, so often they use, um, I, don't know if you've heard of, I don't know if you've heard of Bayesian reasoning, but it's, a, it's an idea of using uh, statistical, t statistical results basically to update your beliefs based on new evidence. And, uh, I think th this sort of model would, ha would be particularly relevant to addressing that question of how much evidence is necessary. Um, I'm not quite sure how you'd fit that into the framework of these other, some of these other models of explanation. Um, 
to be honest. But it's it's a really it's a really difficult question, and I, I think like people like Kuhn would, would probably say that it's it, it's not a sort of a neat situation where the evidence just accumulates and it reaches some sort of objective level. Um, there's sort of these paradigm shifts where just at some point uh, for some partly rational, partly irrational or irrational reasons that the, the um, body of scientists just sort of jumps over to a new way of looking at things and understanding things. And uh, I, I mean, I think in part that that's, that's true, but uh, basically I would say that I don't really have any answers to that and I don't think philosophers have agreed upon answers to that, but um, we sort of do our best. It's a, it's a fuzzy notion of, of how much evidence is needed to justify particular claims. And certainly we can say that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Uh, most people I think would agree with that. Cashing that out in particular instances can be very difficult. Uh, yes? James, can I ask that question for you? You don't mind mine. <laughs> <laughs> can I have a go? Use Bayesian uh, induction of hypotheses. So yep. Ten models. What you first do is, is you distribute entropy across all ten models. They're all equally certain. Ten models, 0.1 percent certain in all of them. You do the experiments, and then some models become more certain because there's more evidence for them. Very likely, you'll never get a model. So you take the top one, the one that has one point five, is the least wrong mm -hmm. hypothesis. You might have two hypotheses, one point nine four, one point nine five. So you use one on Monday, Tuesday, and Friday, and you're not in it, right? But the degree of certainty, the degree of evidence, is the degree. Of, uh, how do you reckon? How do you reckon the hypotheses? By certainty. Yeah, if I just make a couple of comments about that, because I'm, I'm very sympathetic to this sort of Bayesian notion, this very statistical way of updating beliefs, but there are people who are much less um, enthusiastic about it, because let me just uh, outline a couple of the problems. One issue with these sort of very statistical models of evidence is that they don't seem to say much anything about causation, and it seems, at least to a lot of people, that causation is very important in science. It's not just about statistical regularities, it's about we want to, we want to, we want to figure out what the actual underlying causal mechanisms of, of things are in the real world in some sense, and these very statistical approaches don't seem to address that in a direct way. Um, so you might say, well, no, science doesn't say about causation, it's just, it's just observing regularities, but this is where people have sort of slightly different intuitions. Um, there are also other technical issues with Bayesianism. Um, a big issue is how you distribute the, what's called the prior probabilities. That's sort of like where you start from. Um, so there, there are people who, uh, as you mentioned, um, take approaches based on en entropy and um, equally weighting different models, but uh, again, this gets very technical very quickly and people have different views about exactly how that should be done. There's also issues with like how you put a bound on the possible range of parameters and other things like that. So uh, I think broadly I would say that I'm very uh, sympathetic to that broad approach, but I think there are still issues to be nutted out there and uh, people will disagree about it. So, um, yeah. Was there another? Yeah, over here. Oh, James, um, I was thinking about the realist and about theoretical entities. Yep. And I was wondering what Yeah, I think that, that's an interesting point. So that there may be a, a, a situation where we start off with certain entities being theoretical because they can't be directly observed. Certainly germs are like that. That's actually a really good example because a lot of the initial scepticism towards the germ theory of disease was the notion that, well, this is ridiculous. We're saying a bunch of invisible entities that we can't see in any way are responsible for disease. People thought that was absurd. But the developments in microscopy and other things now allow us to directly observe these things and we can see that they are real. So is, is, the question is, is that an argument for scientific realism? Personally, I would say that I wouldn't consider that to be a very strong argument. The main thing is because I think it's problematic to, um, to generalise too much. So that's an argument for some entities that were theoretical have now become sort of more directly observable and so we sort of know that they're real in some sense. Um, does that mean that all theoretical entities will someday become observable or that we have reason to think that they will be or even if they won't become observable, does it mean that we have reason to think they exist? Maybe. I can see how you might use a sort of inductive argument there. Well, they've worked, it's worked in the past, so maybe we can apply it to these other cases. But I can also see an argument for, well, it seems there's a quite a bit of a difference maybe between photons and electrons than there is in the case of, of germs and, and DNA. Um, maybe they're, 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 different, um, they're different issues there. I think there's also a potential for saying that the question of scientific realism differs between disciplines. So maybe uh, when we're talking about like a species or a... Um, a gene, or as you mentioned, DNA, for example, in, in biology. 
Maybe the question as to whether those are real in some sense is a bit of a different question to whether photons and electrons and quarks are real in physics. Um, uh, this would be related to, I suppose, the question of reductionism in science. Can you reduce biology to chemistry and chemistry to physics, or are they sort of their own separate realms? Um, so I think that's an interesting argument. I'm not sure I would say that it's uh, sort of a knockdown for, for realism, but again, a lot of this depends on your intuitions about how you can compare different realms of science with each other, and yeah, people don't agree about that, so that's a tricky one. Um, anyone else? Yep. Uh, feel free to dismiss this question if you okay. haven't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't, um, don't, if you haven't looked into a blockchain and have a strong opinion on it, but I was wondering. So two two mutual related questions, very similar though. Um, ha have there been? Uh, do you know of any economic, political, or social reforms which have been proposed in order to address these problems in the scientific method? Uh, and B, have there been any experiments where, for example, I don't know, they've abolished a material, material incentive uh, altogether and just said all of these scientists in this academy will be paid the exact same rate this year regardless of what they study? Uh, have there been any experiments and are there any proposed alternatives? Hmm. That's an interesting question. This is a fairly a new field, which um, you might probably call the, the sociology of science or even the, the economics of science. It's a little bit different, I would say, from the philosophy of science, um, although there's, of course, some overlap. Um, it's not something I've read extensively about. There are certainly a lot of criticisms about the current model of how science is done. So, like with, for example, uh, the process of peer review, the process of giving academics tenure, um, the, the way that journals publish or don't publish their results, and the issue of um, the file drawer effect. So, some studies get published and others don't, and that sort of skews the, the results that, that we see. Uh, of course, the incentives about what gets studied and what doesn't, and funding biases and other things like that. So, there's a whole basket of different issues there. Um, I'm not aware of very specific, I mean there are people who propose that well we need to do something about this and there are certain models like open access journals online for instance and other things like that. People have proposed getting rid of tenure. Um, I don't know how far these have gone or if, how successful they've really been. I suppose that that would be an empirical question to some degree. Um, I'm not sure though that these type of questions directly address many of the issues that I spoke about here because these seem to be more less about incentives and sociology a little bit about those, but more about sort of uh, broader philosophical questions, say about inductional realism. Um, so again, maybe there's some overlap there, but I, I would say that maybe that's a bit of a different question. Okay, um, yeah, so thanks James very Sorry. much for that. And uh, we have a break now. Um, and we can get back at about like half past or 35 past, that should be enough time for people to grab a coffee. There's edible food out there. And there's some molly water as well. So, enjoy. Yes. <laughs> non